All right, so what we're going to talk about today, muscle contraction in older population exercise programs. So the purpose of this presentation kind of reiterate here, we're going to briefly touch on basic physiology of a muscle contraction to expand on specific aspects related to a muscle contraction and apply them to the older populations uh, in an exercise program. So specifically motor unit recruitment and stretch reflex, these are the things we're going to touch on. So, just to start out with, we're going to go over the types of muscle contraction. There's two different divisions we can make it up into, isometric and isotonic. So, the isometric contraction is a contraction in which the muscle is activating, it is contracting, but there is no noted movement at the joint. There's no shortening, there's no lengthening of that muscle, it's just constant contraction. So, we go to an isotonic contraction in which the muscle is either shortening or lengthening, there's a change at that joint angle, there is a change in length of that muscle, um, and either of those could either be concentric here, which is an active shortening of the muscle, and eccentric, uh, which is an active lengthening of the muscle. And the big thing you want, I want you to focus on here is active, active lengthening of the muscle. An eccentric contraction is not a concentric contraction, and then it relaxes. That's a passive sliding back to normal. This is an active lengthening of the muscle. So getting into a little bit of a physiology of muscle contraction, this is a basic overview, we're not going super in depth with this, we do want to give an overview of this for a little bit of background though. So motor unit, uh, nerve impulse, reaches near muscular junction, and at that point acetylcholine is released which initiates a muscle impulse. And with that muscle impulse, calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and binds and exposes the active sites on the thin actin filaments. At that point, the myosin heads they then attach to the active uh, sites and it results in a myosin cross bridge. And the myosin heads then are connected. At this point, these two structures are connected and the myosin heads begin to pivot and then they detach and then they reattach in the same processes and this happens multiple times throughout a contraction. And this is all based off of or um, so it's possible by ATP hydrolysis. Now relaxation, that happens through calcium ions are then transported back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum via an ATP ion pump and depolarizes the muscle. Now, this results in a passive sliding of the filaments to a normal muscle length. Now, the reason why I touched on active portion of an eccentric contraction, this is a passive sliding. This is not an eccentric contraction. Depolarization does not result in an eccentric contraction. It results in that passive sliding of the filaments to a normal muscle length. So moving on, we're going to talk about motor units. Um, we're going to get into motor unit recruitment here in a second, but specifically motor units is a functional unit of a movement. So the anatomy of that is a cell body, an axon, and the dendrites responsible for the innervation of specific muscle fibers. Now the motor unit is responsible for the nerve innervation. Uh, this, this causes an, uh, either an excitation or an inhibition of that muscle fiber and the excitation of that is a muscle twitch. Each muscle fiber, that motor unit is causing a muscle twitch. Now each motor unit, uh, there's, there may be thousands of motor units throughout the body, but they innervate even more muscle fibers. So the, the subtype of which, whether it's small or a large motor unit, may be reliant on how many muscle fibers they innervate. We'll get to that in a second. So the main thing I want you to take away from this is the amount of tension is dependent on both the frequency of motor unit stimulation and number of motor units stimulated. So the force production is dependent on both frequency of the motor unit stimulation and the number of motor units that are recruited, that are stimulated via that electrical current. So digging a little deeper, motor unit recruitment. This describes adding motor units to increase muscle force to maybe overcome a larger external resistance. So motor units are all or nothing principle recruitment meaning that a certain threshold has to be met in order for that motor unit to contract. It doesn't contract halfway if it's only half to the threshold. It has to be all the way up to the threshold. If that threshold is met, the motor unit contracts all or nothing principle. 
So the response to external force. We already said that motor unit recruitment is adding motor units to increase that muscle force. So the external force is what it's responding to. It's responding to the increased muscle demand. It recruits more motor units to increase the force production to meet that resistance. So we're talking about motor unit subtypes, types of contractions, sort of kind of go hand in hand with this. So motor unit subtypes, you, they can break them up into two different groups. Small, which innervate a small number of muscle fibers. Responsible more from fine motor movement. So dexterity, your fingers, eye movements, those are all, those are all muscles that are innervated by small motor units that allow for those finer motor movements. And large motor units that innervate thousands, hundreds of thousands of muscle fibers per motor unit. These create a very forceful contraction. It's not fine motor, it's very forceful contraction. So then we look at how we measure motor units, how we measure the contractions of that, how we uh, monitor electro, um, electrical currents through the muscles, through electromyogram. So during an isometric contraction, for example, there's an initial spike in motor unit recruitment, there's an initial spike in electrical current. And once those, because we're all or nothing principle, once those motor unit thresholds are met, for that force production, that force is produced and it tapers off. The initial spike in motor unit recruitment then levels off into what is needed to overcome that, for, that resistance force. So think about fatigue in motor units. As we transition to this, you're gonna realize why. Keep that in your head as you go to this next one. So studies have shown conflicting theories in relation to motor unit recruitment and firing rates. Through the research throughout the years, there's always been conflicting theories. Now in the 1970s, these individuals conducted a study and they concluded that constant submaximal sub isometric contraction of up to 12 seconds, they never went over 12 seconds, showed a decrease in motor unit recruitment. So they always thought you, you steadily decrease. That's fatigue of muscles. You steadily decrease. Now, one thing they noted in their study is did we get to fatigue and did we hit the endurance limit? Clearly, they didn't at 12 seconds because at 2005, these individuals did, this, did a similar study and they concluded that as the muscle experienced fatigue, they got to that point of muscle fatigue and as it experienced that, new motor units were recruited, an increase in the firing rate, and overall muscle recruitment across the board increased. Completely conflicts with here. So, again, go back to conflicting theories in relation to this, and these were all done with individuals that were healthy. Um, typical age, so I want to kind of transition here and kind of apply this. Could, could, could training initially at a fatigue limit, because this, at this most recent study tells us that we have to experience fatigue in order to get this, could that help speed along strength program in early stages? So could facilitating motor unit recruitment allow us to bridge that gap between getting off the couch and being proficient and getting to hyperplasia, hypertrophy, which are benefits of strength program. So we see this motor unit activation and muscle pattern movement, so PNF. We see it in rehab all the time from a aspect of this individual has lost what they once had, their activities of daily living have changed due to a surgery or an injury or something like that. And we use, uh, for example, Russian stimulation to for motor unit recruitment and muscle contraction or uh, muscle pattern movements of PNF to retrain the muscle how to contract the correct way. This isn't much different than taking somebody off an injury as taking an older population, elderly individual who's coming off the couch and their activities of daily living are completely lower than what they want to get to. This isn't much different. So that's where I want to go to the next slide and say right here, older population application. So, comes back to our question, could motor unit recruitment be trained? So we had to train during, train to fatigue, so could training muscle endurance um, you know, increase motor unit recruitment, and could doing that in the beginning portions help the strength training program with the older population? And what's the application for older populations? 
So increased um, benefits, they, they can happen faster. Uh, balance is increased. Muscle force production increased. These are all things that you tap into something that's already there. You don't have to create, you don't have to do hypoplasia, hypertrophy. These are giving those older populations that kind of jump. I could be completely off base, but it's something to think about because as graduate students, this master program, this is our job. Our job is to take something that's already in place, or maybe that's not in place at all, and put it into a different spectrum. Change your, your point of view, change your frame. Something to think about. So segue into stretch reflex, you look at the function of a postural help, balance and coordination, muscle link regulation, all of which are components that you would see in an older population, they would have deficits. So the components of a stretch reflex, a muscle spindle and a Golgi tendon organ, if you look at a muscle spindle, it sends that response that your muscle is being stretched, your response sends a response up the loop to uh, elicit a contraction to stop that. And then the Golgi tendon organ sends an inhibitory response for the antagonist muscle to relax for that to allow reciprocal inhibition. So this is where stretch reflex happens. And then we move towards plyometric exercise. So talking about what that is, the amortization period. Now plyometric exercise is utilizing a stretch reflex, that powerful contraction of the short amortization period, which is the eccentric contraction to a concentric contraction. That that period of time between those two, that plyometric utilizes that stretch reflex for an increased force production from muscle spindle response. So we're gonna look at this specifically for older populations, but also I want you to note that PNF in relation to flexibility, also stretch reflex, they can use that uh, stretch reflex to help with the reciprocal inhibition to stretch the, the opposite muscle. Now that can help with injury prevention. So we look at the research. 2010, it was noted there were a couple key points of plyometric. Now, preactivation, which is the tension build in a muscle before striking the ground. So your muscle is contracting before it hits. Okay, that tension is then used to utilize the stretch reflex a little better. And then moves on to the next portion, reflex facilitation during the late eccentric phase. So we're getting into the amortization period. Late eccentric phase early concentric phase. So the ability to utilize that stretch reflex during that amortization period increases the amount of plyometric power you're able to produce. So you can look at it in reverse and say that if you're able to perform a plyometric appropriately, then you're good at preactivation and your utilization or facilitation of the stretch reflex is good. So then studies have shown that conflicting information about specific adaptations for, ex for plyometric exercise. Now, pretty much everybody re agrees on muscle strength and power and increase in explosive jumping. Everyone kind of agrees with that. There's no real discrepancy with that. Now what's been conflicting is fiber type change and neuromuscular adaptations. It's been shown to increase the amount of type 2A fast twitch fibers um, as, you know, as a result of hypoplasia and neuromuscular adaptations are also something that's kind of come along with that. Because if you think back to the function of a stretch reflex, part of that function is balance and coordination, which is neuromuscular adaptation to the T. So you can see how that would be a portion that would increase, because you're utilizing the stretch reflex in a plyometric. So then we get to our point. Plyometric training applications in older populations. Now I'm not talking about plyometrics as in you're going to go make them do depth jumps and box jumps and things that is going to put them, hurt their knees and there's other things you have to think about. But a controlled plyometric, which is the shortening of an amortization period, utilizing that stretch reflex between the eccentric and concentric phase for a powerful contraction, could we use it to increase neuromuscular function? Some say yes. Could we increase kinesthesia, spatial awareness, potentially? improvement of activities of daily living, which is what we're really, really striving for through neuromuscular function. If we increase that, our activities of daily living would have, then you have to go back to, would motor recruitment help with that? Also injury prevention. So we talked about PNF a little bit. Um, a, a powerful contraction with increased neuromuscular function. 
going back to your stretch reflex. These are all things that could cause injury prevention. So as we think about these basic concepts, dig a little deeper and then apply them to a population, which is what we do as exercise physiologists, I want you to think about the older population and what if this makes sense. And I want to leave you with what sparks interest. So for me, in this topic, I was an athletic training student, my undergrad, and I worked with collegiate athletes, high performance athletes, division one, division two, that's who I worked with. I never really wanted to work with the rehabilitation of older populations in a clinical setting. It wasn't my cup of tea. But then I started doing personal training, and I worked with older populations. And then you realize it's basically rehabilitation. So the cross training there is very specific between rehabilitation and older population exercise programs. Basically a long duration rehabilitation program because they have now lost what they had and they have deficits, have injuries, maybe long standing, and rehabilitation specifically for those deficits is the only way to get them back to increased activities of daily living. So I guess I challenge you to ask dumb questions. Some of this is a little out there. Some of it needs to be studied. Some of it's never been studied. Older population studies around muscle contraction is not there. Spyometrics is kind of crazy because everyone thinks about that as a very forceful contraction, very dangerous, uh, and it can be. So get outside your comfort zone. This is why we're in school, this is why we're going for our master's degree, is, is to apply what we know in multiple different areas and see if we can apply that in a very narrowed scope. So ask dumb questions, get outside your comfort zone.